New York, a city of industry and ingenuity, and at its heart, a museum of science and humanity with secrets dark and strange. Mesozoic mayhem, cosmic mysteries, and an encrypted message from a once proud civilization. Secrets hidden in plain sight inside the American Museum of Natural History. America's capital of culture and business, and a magnet for immigrants from all over the world. And across from Central Park, a world under one roof, the American Museum of Natural History. The museum covers an entire city block, home to 32 million specimens from all over the planet. But none are more impressive than these, a herd of African elephants. It's hard to gaze up at the elephants without feeling their power. For many visitors, the word that will spring to mind is majestic, or perhaps even noble. Just a few blocks south on Broadway, the same words apply to our favorite fictional African animals, kings of a sunny savanna. But not so long ago, African wildlife occupied a different place in the popular imagination. Early Hollywood portrayed a vision of the ferocious beasts of darkest Africa. Jeanette Eileen Jones is a cultural historian who studies portrayals of Africa. All those images of just wild animals that will attack you at no provocation, um, that it's a dangerous place, that the climate is not hospitable, particularly to whites. Back then, this scary image of African wildlife was reinforced in museums. With an African lion, uh, often they're depicted snarling and as mean and ferocious as possible. It looks more like a gargoyle or mythical beast. This stuffed lion would have been typical a hundred years ago. Like a B-movie villain, it's a stereotype lacking character. How did museum specimens go from this to this? And how did Africa's wildlife exchange their evil image for one of nobility and light? The answer begins with a man named Carl Akeley. Akeley was a young man who loved uh, natural history and uh, wildlife. He grew up in New York State on a farm. Uh, at an early age, he developed an interest in taxidermy. On the farm, Akeley grew up around animals that were slaughtered, so stuffing animals wasn't a big step. The largest animal then in captivity was an African elephant named Jumbo. When Jumbo was killed by a train, Akeley took part in his preservation. Jumbo was transformed into the largest stuffed animal in history. It was from that experience that Akeley gained his fame. He won a job at the American Museum of Natural History by promising to create an exhibit of African elephants. Akeley had been to Africa before, but he saw something very different than what appeared in the movies. He sees beauty in the flora and the fauna. He sees beauty in, in Africa that is linked to its natural landscape. In 1909, Akeley looks for elephants in the forests of Mount Kenya. And it's here that Africa teaches him a lesson. He's charged by an elephant, pinning him to the ground. Suffering a badly broken nose, for a time he looked a bit like the elephant man. The life-threatening experience could have made him hate Africa, but the continent worked on his spirit in a different way. It was said that during that convalescence, he dreamt of this splendid hall, this uh, hall of African mammals that would celebrate the beauty and splendor of African wildlife. When Akeley returned to New York, he began to realize his dream by reinventing taxidermy. Steve Quinn takes us into an area the public never sees to show us the difference Akeley made. 
The big difference with this method of taxidermy is, if you listen, it's hollow. Uh, and that's the clue, uh, which indicates that it's Akeley's method. Rather than stuff specimens with straw, Akeley used their skeletons to create hollow molds with muscles shaped in clay to match the measurements made in the field. And because the sculpture was sculpted to the exact specifications of that animal, the skin, when tanned, fit like a glove. The results were the most lifelike African specimens ever seen, but Akeley was only getting started. Up until now, most museums had presented animals as isolated specimens. But Akeley wanted to show animals within their natural habitat. He took artists to Africa to record the animal's home environment, which they then recreated on curved painted backdrops behind the stuffed animals. These scenes are called dioramas. Akeley borrowed the technique from the theater. He urged the patrons of the American Natural History Museum to pay for a brand new gallery to be filled with 28 African dioramas. In an age before television, this exhibit would be the only way New Yorkers would ever see these exotic African animals. One animal was known and unknown, the mountain gorilla. For the movie-going public, the gorilla was a savage beast that deserved to die at Tarzan's hand. The mountain gorilla was steeped in folklore and myth and thought to charge on sight of a human and snap rifles with its jaws and run off with women into the forest. In Akeley's eyes, the mountain gorilla was a gentle giant. But in 1921, the only way to show the American public the noble gorilla was by killing one. Akeley was amazed by their kinship with humanity, but that made them harder to kill. He later wrote, it took all one's scientific ardor to keep from feeling like a murderer. I was the savage and the aggressor. In 1936, after years of effort and preparation, the Hall of Africa is unveiled. That day, if you read the New York Times, everybody was out there, everyone who was anyone. Mostly a lot of white, upper-class, middle-class people, a lot of patrons. A Times reporter wrote, one can feel the wind sweeping across the plains and mountains to the startled creatures which look out from the grass. There were raves. People were amazed at the realism of the exhibit and the exotic creatures and the, the places depicted. People claimed to have been transported to Africa, like they felt like they were in Africa when they walked through there. But one VIP could not be there that day. Before the work was completed, while on safari in the mountains of the gorillas he loved, Carl Akeley caught dysentery and died. This diorama displays the gorilla he found so hard to kill, and something else as well. If one leans into the diorama and looks to the far right, you'll see uh, Mount Makeno standing against the sky. And when visitors view the diorama, they should realize that it's the burial place of Carl Akeley. His final resting place has become part of his life's work. His heartfelt vision of brightest Africa. Next on Museum Secrets, ancient monsters and modern cures. The American Museum of Natural History is trying to tell us something. It's trying to tell us that all life is connected, even if not all species last forever. These creatures died out 65 million years ago, but dinosaurs are upstarts compared to this strange life form. The oldest horseshoe crab fossil goes back to about the, the late Ordovician, so say about 440, 450 million years old. Oh my goodness. The horseshoe crab is unique, not because it's so old, but because it has survived so long. Most species don't last that long, you know, a couple million years. 
Horseshoe crabs have been around for a long time. This remarkable species has seen the dinosaurs come and go, multiple ice ages, and the rise of the human race. Recently, their continued vitality became linked to our own. Some of the aspects of the immune system of horseshoe crabs are extremely general and useful. They can detect the toxins produced by various bacteria. A unique clotting agent in the crab's blue blood surrounds toxins and neutralizes them. This has made horseshoe crabs invaluable to the pharmaceutical industry. Every year, the blood of thousands of crabs is extracted. It's used to purify the world's vaccines, saving us from dozens of deadly diseases. After some of their blood is taken, the crabs are returned to the wild. But there's a problem. Their breeding grounds, like this stretch of sand 40 kilometers southeast of the museum, have become despoiled by pollution. Their stocks are dwindling. If we want to keep harvesting their blood, we're going to need to breed them in captivity. But this has proved extremely difficult. For decades, biologists have tried to breed them in the lab without success. Then, in the year 2000, Dr. Carmelo Cuomo decided to look for the secret. I think it would be really awful if an organism that has managed to survive countless climate change, glaciations, meteorite impacts, continents coming together and going apart, dies because humans were here. So I, I, it's, I don't know. It speaks to my heart somehow. Carmela began her research by observing the nitty-gritty. What they do is the female digs under and digs, and then she lays the eggs, and then she kind of moves forward, and then the male deposits his sperm. And the females have tremendous numbers of eggs. I mean, they can have, you know, tens of thousands of eggs that they can deposit. As to why they will breed here, but not in captivity, biologists had only a few clues. There's some evidence that they like to be where they were born. It sort of makes sense for a lot of creatures because you know that it worked, so it makes sense to go back there. In her lab, Carmela simulated the conditions of the breeding beach. She placed a male and a female together, and to her utter amazement, they reproduced. They laid eggs, and they continued to lay eggs all till October. Success was so unexpected that Carmela decided not to reveal what happened until she made it happen twice. But at the next breeding cycle, no crab romance. Over here, we have some mating behavior, which does not mean that they're going to mate. It just means because they can hook up like that for a significant portion of the year. Somehow, Carmela had stumbled on the secret and then lost it. didn't seem to us at the time that we had done anything different than we did the year before. And so, I basically, we drove ourselves crazy. It was like, what did we do differently? So we started to take factors out. You know, okay, we'll change the beach. They would show us the behavior, but they wouldn't lay eggs. What was it about a real beach? Was it the tides? The light of the sun? A specific phase of the moon? Carmela's team tried and failed to find the answer for eight long years. And then a couple of years ago, some students were working with me and they went out and collected the crabs and they brought back some sediment that was with them and the water. We put them back out there, we put them in the tank and they made it and they laid eggs and they laid eggs and they laid eggs and then when I looked at my notes, what did I see? I saw the exact same thing that we had done the first year of the thing, which was we brought sand with us from where the animals were. Horseshoe crabs will only breed in the sand where they were born. That is the secret. If we can breed them, make sure nature has a steady supply of them, make sure industry has a steady supply of them, um, everybody will hopefully be happy. But as Carmela and her colleagues know, her solution will only work as long as viable natural habitats continue to exist. So if you destroy the habitats where they live, where they breed, where they eat via pollution or development, then you're really going to hurt these creatures. The fact that, that an organism has been around in some form for so long, it inspires um, an awe 
in me. That's the best way I can say it. And so there's a desire to kind of make sure that these animals continue. For if we can't coexist with a species that has survived for half a billion years, no species is safe. Not even our own. Next on Museum Secrets, dinosaur detectives unearth a murder. Inside the American Museum of Natural History, the ancient bones of dinosaurs inspire awe and questions. How did this plant eater live? How did this meat eater die? To discover the answers, all we have to go on is the physical evidence. And that's why behind the scenes, the museum's paleontology department looks a lot like a modern crime lab. I see right there. Yeah. The museum's head paleontologist, Mark Norell, is one of the world's leading dinosaur detectives. We're able to use CAT scans to be able to peer into things. We're able to use mass spectrometers, which are able to like look at things in very, very low concentration. Advances in technology have, has changed the way that we do things really dramatically. High-tech tools can amplify a detective's deductive powers, but sometimes an investigation remains unsolved until a new piece of evidence blows the case wide open. That's what happened when Mark Norell found this. I think it was a really exciting moment when we found it, and we knew that because basically we were overturning over 60 years of sort of orthodoxy in the field. What it is and what it revealed is our museum secret. The story begins in 1922, as the American Museum of Natural History mounts its first major expedition to the deserts of Mongolia. The museum's explorers made their way through mud, sandstorms, and searing heat. Mongolia really turned out to be a treasure trove for fossils. The American Museum collected fossils there of everything from dinosaurs to mammals, and lots of them. Probably their most spectacular finds were found at a place called the Flaming Cliffs. Beneath the cliffs, they found dozens of skeletons of a plant-eating dinosaur called Protoceratops. This evidence revealed for the first time that some dinosaurs lived in deserts. And then they unearthed a type of fossil that no one had seen before. Dinosaur eggs. They found several dinosaur nests during the 1923 expedition, but one of the most spectacular things that they found was a dinosaur nest with the remains of another dinosaur lying on top of it. The animal that was found on top of the nest, though, wasn't a protoceratops. It was a carnivorous dinosaur, which they named Oviraptor. The fossil evidence pointed to a kind of crime scene. They deduced that the Oviraptor died while stealing an egg, caught in the act by a mother protoceratops. The 65 million year old story became front page news. When the news first came back to New York, I mean, it was big news. It made all the newspapers and everything else made newsreel footage. The museum displayed the prehistoric family scene of dinosaur eggs and their proud parents. The dinosaur detectives were celebrated for the brilliant deduction that revealed the violent death of the egg stealing Oviraptor. But this isn't our museum's secret because their conclusion was completely wrong. In the next part of our detective story, Mark Norell plays a leading role, because he himself is a gifted sleuth. In the 1990s, he was in the forefront of the discovery that two-legged dinosaurs looked less like this, and more like this. This revelation became another front page story called The Truth About Dinosaurs. Just about everything you believe is wrong. 20 years ago, we didn't know they had feathers. We know that now. 20 years ago, we didn't know that they had bird-like physiologies. We know that now. So there's been a lot of progress made. To discover more about the link between dinosaurs and birds, Mark Norell led a team back to Mongolia. Like their predecessors of the 1920s, they found skeletons of plant-eating protoceratops, along with a clearly bird-like specimen of the egg-stealing oviraptor. 
And then they discovered something no one had found before. As they carefully uncovered a dinosaur nest, they found one egg with a fossilized embryo still inside. Inside the egg, there was the, an embryo of a dinosaur. But the embryo wasn't a protoceratops embryo, and the foot was sticking out. It had weathered out of the inside of the egg. And I could tell that it was the foot of an oviraptorid dinosaur. And that means that the oviraptor found on the nest was not there to steal, but to nurture. It was sitting on top of its nest, probably brooding it or taking care of it, just in the same way modern birds do today. Mark's discovery refuted the old conclusions about oviraptor behavior and proved that the museum had been wrong about who laid the eggs. One new piece of evidence had unlocked a secret and completely changed the story. And as to how the mother oviraptor died, researchers now believe she was killed by one of the region's frequent sandstorms. Today, the latest evidence leads Mark to believe that two-legged dinosaurs evolved directly into modern birds. So it may be that if you're out bird watching, you're dinosaur watching too. Next on Museum Secrets, an encrypted message from a once proud civilization. In the American Museum of Natural History, the diversity of nature includes the diversity of human nature, especially the civilizations that have vanished from the Earth. We know these ancient cultures by their works, but we understand them through their words. Egyptian hieroglyphics that tell how to keep a pharaoh safe as he journeys to the afterlife. Or Athenian inscriptions that reveal their love of freedom and how they fought to keep it. But there is one vanished civilization that is silent as the grave. At the beginning of the 16th century, a vast region surrounding what is now Peru was dominated by a people called the Inca. Their ruins suggest a mastery of architecture, but how they hold these massive stones is unknown. Their golden temples reveal their wealth, but we don't know their prayers. We do know the Incas were the undisputed rulers of the Andes. The Spaniards arrived in 1532, amazed by Incan gold and determined to take it all. But today, many historians believe Incan society was missing something. Only with respect to the Inca do we not have their view of their world in their own words. And that's because they did not develop a system of writing in a form that we've identified. The Incas have never been able to speak purely for themselves. Gary Erton is an anthropologist from Harvard University. He's looking for the secret that will give the Inca back their voice. It may be locked in these Incan artifacts called quipu. They look like humble skeins of knotted string, but the Spanish conquistadors believed they were much more than that. When the Spaniards took material out of a storehouse, there was a man there keeping records and he had knotted string devices and he untied knots from one section of the quipu and tied knots in another section as though he was working with a debit and credit type uh, accounting system. When the Inca refused to reveal the knot's secret code, the Spaniards burned every quipu they could find. Their meaning was soon forgotten. Today, only 850 quipus are known to exist. Gary Erton has spent the last 10 years personally examining quipu all over the world. This is a classic Inca quipu here in the sense that... A lover of puzzles, um, he's determined to break the code. Down here, they've tied the units the ones to nines, up here the tens, the hundreds, the thousands. We're pretty sure they were recording censuses and tribute data. All of the sort of nuts and bolts of the business of the Inca state. But why, when other ancients wrote on stone, did the Inca choose string? 
Their empire was held together by a system of roads traversed by messengers called chaskis. Stone tablets would have slowed them down. Kipus were much more runner-friendly. So is this just a lightweight ledger? Burton doesn't think so. On um, the, the kipu that we see here, its knots are not distributed in tiers, like decimal levels, uh, as with those other kipus, but the knots are spread all over the, almost at random over the face, over the surface of the kipu. And we think that these knots had semantic value. Burton believes that these strings may contain words and stories, encoded through color and the choice of knots. Today, Gary and his colleague Amanda Ganaway so hope to prove that knots really can tell stories, starting with a simple story called, What's for Lunch? White's chicken, blue is seafood, green is vegetables. And have perhaps one single knot referred to baked, two to boiled. Can we communicate this all the way across uh, New York City? I think we can. A subway ride later, Gary arrives at the next best thing to an Incan restaurant, a Peruvian one. He orders a traditional meal of chicken, fish, potatoes. Two knots at the top for boiled, so and we know it's white, so we know it's chicken. So it's caldo de pollo. Then a huancaina. That was a long knot of five turns. To transmit his message, Gary employs a chasky runner. Take that to Amanda, please. He's not really Incan. He lives in Brooklyn. But as a runner, he might be a match for a real chasky. Though to be fair, the Inca had to run up and down mountains and Manhattan is nearly flat. Following Inca tradition, we've made our message service a relay. Chaskis would spell each other off every few kilometers, allowing them to cover 240 kilometers a day. Today's distance is much shorter. So he's eating boiled chicken in soup. He's eating a potato dish, yes. two knots, a boiled potato dish. Mm. Aji de la gallina. Aji de gallina. And chicha morada. Chicha morada. Ah, chicha morada. The experiment worked, but relied on made up code. With the Incan quipus, Gary has only half of the secret. We can say that this given string records the number 146, but the question is 146 what? Gary needs something like this, the famous hieroglyphic to Greek dictionary known as the Rosetta Stone. Old Spanish documents come tantalizingly close. We have a string of numbers and then each with its identity. So 40 uh, fanegas, which is a measure, 40 fanegas of potatoes, uh, 30 fanegas of corn. Now, we can't read the identities yet, but we're hoping that one day, if we can find a match to those strings of numbers, then that's our Rosetta Kipu. Gary believes he needs just one match to begin to read the Inca story and for their long silence to be broken. Hopefully, we'll just have that amazing serendipitous convergence of a transcription and a kipu. Gary Erton may be a dreamer, but sometimes you just have to untangle one knot to make the whole string unravel. Next on Museum Secrets, how to catch a shooting star. Some of the world's oldest fossils can be found at the American Museum of Natural History. But the oldest specimens aren't fossils at all. These rocks are over 4.5 billion years old, older than the Earth itself. Some are made of metal, some of stone. And they all have one thing in common. They are all chunks of asteroids that fell to Earth as meteorites. For the curator in charge of this collection, Denton Abel, they are clues to a cosmic mystery. 
Learning about the solar system is intrinsically valuable to humans. In this case, we're learning about how the solar system actually formed. Scientists believe that in the beginning, there was light from our new sun. And there were rocks, asteroids that collided and melted, forming new worlds like Earth. And there was ice from comets. Rocky ice balls, they formed at the cold edge of the solar system. Comets may have brought their ice to the young Earth, creating our oceans. Comets are too large to fit in a hall like this, but Denton Abel would still like to get his hands on one. What we'd really like is a piece of a comet so we can understand better the earliest solar system and how the planets formed and got their water. So scientists need to unlock a cosmic secret. How do you catch a shooting star? In 1996, NASA scientists decided to try. They named their mission Stardust. They planned to send a probe to a comet called Vilt 2, collect some comet dust, and bring it back to Earth. For mission leader Joe Valinga, there was one fundamental challenge. The trick for Stardust was to find some way to capture hypervelocity particles. We're traveling through the coma at 13,000 miles an hour. So how do you do that? How do you capture particles and bring them back? To capture particles, Stardust would need to rendezvous with a comet and enter its volatile tail. A comet's tail forms when it approaches the sun as ice vaporizes and erupts from the surface. Some particles that come off of comets can be larger and some smaller. We, we don't really know whether even a piece of, you know, this big could come off of a comet. Comet grains are six times faster than bullets, and they will heat up when brought to a sudden stop. Conventional materials used for catching bullets aren't strong enough. Steel would be too heavy. And then someone thought of this. It's a material called aerogel. Aerogel is the least dense solid known to humans. And it was invented and perfected over the second half of the 20th century. On the atomic level, its nearly random structure gives aerogel foam exotic properties. One thing that's very important to know about aerogel is what a good insulator it is. You can see we're melting the aluminum, but the wax is just fine. Since it can stop heat, engineers wondered if it might also stop comet dust. Turned out through tests that aerogel could stop particles traveling at, at velocities even somewhat higher than um, 13,000 miles per hour. You could capture very fine particles similar to what would be in a comet coma. We had confidence that the aerogel was really going to work. Joe also knew that no material is perfect. This is about a half a pound meteorite. Aerogel can stand up to significant force, but it's not invulnerable. This is about two pounds. And this supermaterial has its own form of kryptonite. This is ordinary distilled water. What happens is that the water collapses the structure of the aerogel foam itself. Even with these downsides, Joe's team made the collector tiles from aerogel. In all space missions, risk comes with the territory. Ten. On February 7, 1999, Stardust six, six, blasted off. Four, three, two, we have main engine start. Zero and liftoff of the Stardust spacecraft. On a curving trajectory, it would take five years to reach its target. The body of the spacecraft is about the size of a, a telephone booth. The aerogel is hidden in here, and it folds out. First, an arm folds out, and then expose the aerogel grid so that it can collect the cometary particles. Prior to actual encounter, what we had was test data that indicated that, yes, we'd probably be able to stop the particles, but you never know for sure what you're gonna get. I remember the day we were getting ready for the encounter with Comet Vil 2. 
I was in this room when we deployed the Aerogel grid and we watched the telemetry data coming back. We could not tell, though, what happened with collection of the particles. So it was a, a two-year uh, long wait. On January 15, 2006, the Stardust sample capsule re-entered Earth's atmosphere at seven miles per second, becoming the fastest human-made object to return to Earth. No one was sure if the aerogel could withstand the force of rapid deceleration. Would it in fact shatter when we uh, landed? Recent rains had flooded the Utah landing site. There was also the danger that the capsule itself would be penetrated by water upon landing. The recovery team retrieved the capsule with its sample canister. But did the aerogel catch part of a comet? To find out, samples of the aerogel were distributed to scientists around the world, including Denton Abel of the American Museum of Natural History. This is an actual sample of the Stardust return sample suite. Under high magnification, the sample reveals the microscopic trail of a comet particle. You can see here where it's been fractured, the actual fracturing in the aerogel due to the effect of the impact. The fascinating thing about some of the results from Stardust, high temperature materials have been found in the particles. High temperature solids would be the kinds of minerals and magnets you'd see in terrestrial volcanoes, for instance. So at least some comets didn't start out as rock and ice at the edge of the solar system, but much nearer the sun colliding and melting like asteroids. And the aerogel samples contain another surprise, organic molecules needed for the creation of life. So when comets came to Earth, they may have brought more than just water. One of the possibilities is that comets seeded organic material that started the evolution of life on Earth, because it was the Earth was too hot to support organic compounds in the beginning as it cooled. So where did they come from? Possibly from comets. The American Museum of Natural History now has one more tiny rock from outer space. And as far as curator Denton Abel is concerned, there will always be room for more. Next on Museum Secrets, from the museum's past to its future, hidden underground. Since the American Museum of Natural History opened in 1877, its primary mission has been collection and preservation. Seven generations of curators have collected over 20 million specimens on expeditions around the world. The museum's taxidermists pioneered methods to preserve them for the ages. Thanks to their efforts, visitors experience the scope of biodiversity. It's a kind of arc. Though, of course, the animals here only look alive. Far below the public galleries in a room visitors never see is something completely different. Seven vats of stainless steel. When they're opened, this happens. You might be thinking witches and cauldrons. They are not magic, but as we'll see, they're pretty close. What they're doing here is our final museum secret. Today, PhD student Linda Gormazano hunts for a new specimen. She could be on one of the museum's current expeditions to the forests of Peru or the mountains of Mexico. But in fact, she's in upstate New York. Linda and her faithful dog are on the trail of Canis latrans, better known as the coyote. So this is a sample of coyote scat. She doesn't carry a hunting rifle, just a plastic sample bag. Not far away, fellow graduate student Chris Nagy ascends to the nest of a screech owl. He knows the daylight hours are the best time to find her at home. 
He doesn't collect the whole owl. Okay, there's some feathers in here. And by a nearby lake, curator Mark Siddall is after something even smaller. A freshwater leech. Today's specimens won't be featured in a diorama or preserved by the taxidermist's art. Take it back to the lab. Great. Let's right. put it in the jar. Siddall and his colleagues are only interested in one thing. Their specimen's DNA. The technological advances of the last 15 to 20 years have allowed museums to become more than straightforward libraries of biodiversity. Recently, the museum embarked on a new mission to collect the DNA of every life form on Earth. But why do today's curators need to collect DNA in the field? Why don't they extract DNA from the museum's 20 million specimens? The reason is that stuffed animals do not retain their DNA. The DNA dries out and falls apart. And other traditional preservation methods aren't much better. Standard procedures of preserving animals or plants in formalin or even in alcohol are not suitable for holding on to that kind of genetic information for a long period of time. To preserve DNA requires something completely different. Well, welcome to our frozen tissue collection. Um, as you can see here, we have uh, seven large cryovats here, which uh, actually contain the liquid nitrogen um, that keeps our samples secure and safe. DNA stored in these supercooled vats should remain viable for a thousand years. Project leader George Amato likes to discourage curious curators from discovering what absolute cold feels like. If someone were to put their unprotected hands or arms inside the container, we like to say they then become part of the collection. Every day, the museum's expeditions send back more DNA samples to add to the new collection. And unlike traditional expeditions, these DNA hunters don't need to bring back the entire animal. Feces will do, and even feathers. The part I'm interested in is the very, very tip of the feather, where hopefully there's some, a few skin cells um, of the owl that left on there. I'll scrape those off and extract the DNA. In some ways, the frozen tissue collection is continuing the tradition of the other collections here at the museum. That is, we want to have archived here a record of the diversity of life on the planet. 1837, 82. Having those tissues available under liquid nitrogen will greatly facilitate the scope of work that can happen here even 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. Currently, the vats preserve the DNA of several species that are nearing extinction. Their number will continue to grow. And as it does, the American Museum of Natural History moves a step closer to becoming a real ark, preserving the blueprint of every life form for the future. For every mystery we reveal, far more must remain unspoken. Secrets of the human spirit and of the human heart, hidden in plain sight inside the American Museum of Natural History.